So, John. Yeah. Why was the SEO professional disappointed when they had twins? I'm not sure why. No SEO loves duplicate content. <laughs> You're listening to the Lion Share Marketing Podcast for marketing leaders by marketing leaders. Brought to you by Fidelitas.co. All right, everybody, welcome to episode 124 of the Lion Share Marketing Podcast. I am Tyler Sickmeyer, joined by John the Wizard Merlin, both of Fidelitas.co, your full stack marketing agency for all of your PR and marketing needs when you need a strategically driven solution with measurable results. We're the ones you contact. But, John, that's not why we're here today. We're going to give the people what they want, which is actionable content insights with great stories and, of course, a marketing dad joker three. So, John, great episode lined up. We've got Doug Allen, who is the founder of Calm Moment Beverages, coming on the show today, talking about his CBD-infused beverages and all of the challenges and uh, opportunities lying in launching a beverage brand from scratch. So, special treat for our listeners today. But before we get to our interview with Doug, John. What's in the news? News team, assemble! So today we're talking about my favorite uh, company, someone that I use their software every day, and that's Adobe. And they just announced that they're making a huge $20 billion acquisition of one of their competitors, Figma. Now, uh, Figma has been super popular lately especially among the new uh, uh, college graduates. And, um, uh, you know, it's not enter enterprise software. You can start out for free. And it's essentially like if you mixed Google Docs with design software. It's extremely collaborative. Um, you, you can track all the changes live. You can do it with a team. Um, it's been getting more and more popular. I've seen it now uh, required on a lot of uh, job applications that you have to know how to use Figma. So they're definitely... Uh, have been taking some of uh, Adobe's market share. And so I think this is a really smart uh, purchase on Adobe's uh, part that they can uh, get that user base and start to leverage some of their software. I know for a fact there are collaborative web versions of Photoshop and Illustrator either in beta or in the works. And so I know that this was the direction they were heading anyways. Figma got a head start. And so it's cool to see that now they'll have the Figma team with uh, Adobe and and all Adobe users will, you know, probably get better integrations with Figma. And um, I think it's I'm really excited about this acquisition. Yeah, I'd say the real winner here is the customer at the end of the day. Right. Because if you're already using the Adobe stack, I'd imagine they're going to roll that out. And this was uh I think this was as much defense for Adobe as anything, right? They wanted to right. quash an up and coming competitor. And uh, like I said, I think they'll eventually uh, roll, they'll, they'll eventually do away with the Figma product or it'll be rolled into the Adobe suite. But I think the technology is the bigger thing. They're going to, they, they eliminate a competitor, they add the tech stack into their own uh, platform, and save themselves a lot of trouble in the process as far as building out that technology themselves. So, yeah. It's it's an interesting uh, it's an interesting play. I wonder how much market share they'll reacquire with that. Mm -hmm. how, how you know how big is Adobe at the end of the day? So, right, Adobe's taken some pretty big swings in the yeah. acquisition space. You know, you date back to when they acquired Magento, right? And so, uh, you, you know, this isn't their first time spending a lot of money. Although I'll tell you what, congrats to the uh, Figma founders. Uh, I believe <laughs> John, they were bootstrapped. Yep. There yep. Is, so there is no venture capital equity to dilute that that 20 billion is going to the individuals that started the company so they started uh, in 2012 so in 10 years they made themselves uh, billionaires so yeah good. And, and the and the vcs that supported them so yeah no actually that's what i'm saying they didn't have any oh i, I think yeah. there may be a few but um uh yeah anyways uh, the figma team is definitely i'm sure excited about this acquisition yeah, absolutely. And they're all shopping for their own personal uh, professional, <laughs> which, by the way, you know, we weren't going to put the sharks on the market yet. But if you're looking for somewhere to drop a billion dollars, I'm sure we can figure it out. So uh, maybe even a majority stake for a billion. So uh, congrats to the Figma team and really congrats to all the creatives, uh, John and your counterparts and uh, everyone listening to this podcast, because, again, anything that makes uh, our work more effective and efficient, the better off we are. And 
uh, it's also reflective, I think, of where things are going. You know, more and more of the mm-hmm. workforce is remote, and there's a need for collaboration beyond hopping on a Zoom call all the time. And right. uh, Figma enables some of that on the creative side. So I think this will be uh, an interesting development and uh, looking forward to seeing how Adobe rolls this out once the uh, purchase actually uh, closes and uh, see what their plans are for Figma in 2023. But, uh, John, again, great interview coming up with Doug. Let's get to it. Okay, hey guys, I'm excited to be joined by Doug Allen, the founder of Calm Moment, which is an incredible CBD beverage. Doug, welcome to the Lion Share Marketing Podcast. Thank you for having me. Of course, of course. So, Doug, tell us a little bit about how Calm Moment came into existence. Sure. Um, so, I've got a business partner. Um, her name is Jamie Diaz, and she also is my sister in law. Um, and nice. so, uh, Back when the pandemic started in March 2020, she started drinking a little bit more alcohol than <laughs> than normal. As, as did most of the country, and, and my wife, and as did a lot of people. Yeah. In the world. Uh, and so, at a, at a doctor's appointment around that time, her doctor was telling her, "Jamie, you got to you know cut down your alcohol consumption. You know, it's just not good for your overall health." And so she listened to her doctor, and so she started consuming the CBD beverages that were relatively new at that point, two years ago. And she loved what the CBD did for her. And she loved how it impacted her body. She loved how it helped calm her down and bring that ritual that a glass of wine was bringing for a period where you couldn't go out uh, anywhere, right? And so she loved that ritual. But what she didn't like about what she was picking up um, from these beverages was the flavor and the quality of the product. And so she and I have never worked on a business together. Um, and so, but this is the first for anything, right? And yeah. she approached me and said, Hey, Doug, why don't we develop a better product to meet the need in the market? Because I have developed a few other businesses in the past. Um, and so I was, you know, I'm an entrepreneur in the family and um, have experience uh, getting businesses off the ground. And she had the wonderful idea. And so we came together and we spent about 18 months. Uh, putting the business together, putting the branding together, and most importantly, putting the uh, beverages together in a way that we're proud of uh, in terms of the quality of ingredients, in terms of the quality of the product, in terms of the branding, uh, and in terms of the quality of the taste of the product. And so we actually brought on board a third partner as well, who is a world-class food and beverage product developer. And so he, Jim White, his name, and cool. uh, he lives in uh, Napa Valley along with uh, myself. And so we, the three of us, went down this journey and about a month and a half ago, brought our product to life, to market. Uh, so we're brand new and uh, calm moment. The world needs more calm. This is your moment. That's awesome. That's awesome. And talk about, so you, you just came to market, I, I want to make sure I heard you correctly, a few months ago? Uh, about six weeks ago. Six weeks ago. Oh, so brand, brand new. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. So, so how, how's it going so far? Have you found any traction yet? What, what are your wins so far out of the gate? Absolutely. Yeah. We're doing great. So, uh, having, we're up here in Northern California. And so, using Napa County and Sonoma County as our base market, uh, I've been selling my product out of the back of my car, um, literally out of the back of my car, which is how you get things started. Right. And it's not the first yeah. time. I've sold my products, my new products on the back of a car. Um, and so it's something that I've, I've been through before. Um, and that, that experience, you know, helps build confidence. And, you know, I, I, we know uh, where to zig, where to zag, along with other experience we've had in our professional lives as well, right? But, um, and so I just started knocking on doors. And the gatekeepers were very receptive because the the CBD beverage category, especially in California, it was completely legalized in California back in October. And so, um, you know, we're just ahead of the curve, uh, but the, the flood is coming of these products. But what I've been showing out in the market the past six weeks, I've been getting phenomenal re- re- uh, response on from the gatekeepers, right? And that's that's only one part of the equation is getting it through the gatekeeper. 
the most important part of the equation is getting it through to the consumer, right? Absolutely. And getting it yep. pulled off the shelf. And so that's where, you know, where my scorecard is, obviously, is how much is getting pulled off the shelf. And I, at this point in time, um, I have actually stopped taking new accounts because my pull through has been so good on the product that I don't want to run out of my first batch of inventory <laughs> till I get the yep. second batch of inventory. And I'm not just, you know, sugarcoating this for, you know, a, a podcast or whatever. Um, it, the, the response has been overwhelmingly uh, positive um, because of the the marketing points that we've created around the product. First and foremost, it tastes better than anything else on the market. It's all natural. It's preservative free. And those two things in this category are very hard to come by. Um, getting it to be preservative free, especially without Velcrin. Uh, if, if anybody out there knows what Velcrin is. Uh, we are not using any of that stuff. It's GMO-free, vegan, gluten-free, uh, made in the U.S., and most importantly, it tastes amazing. Um, and I do have a couple cans here to show the the, the packaging. Awesome. But, um, but yeah, so great. the response will be great. And, and so to that end, we actually have just signed um, a distributor here for Northern California. Um, awesome. You know, and, and so getting it out, out in a little, little bit wider distribution. Um, and, and yeah, it's a typical... Um, you know, maybe, maybe not typical, atypical growth. You know, we're, we're seeing really good growth. Um, and so we entered this market at knowing that it's very early on and knowing that there are more competitors coming out every day. Um, but I come from a very, very competitive industry from the wine industry. And so having a few uh, competitors on the shelf doesn't really phase me a whole lot. Knowing that if your product is good, if the price point's right, if your marketing's good, um, and your distribution um, is is solid, then got a, got a good business. Absolutely, a absolutely. And and so, uh, I, I'm I'm curious. I want to go down this rabbit hole a little bit because I think so many of our marketing leaders listening in right now have a side project that they'd love to launch and, and yeah. have for whatever reason, or they're working on it, or maybe they did launch it and it got stuck and it failed before it really even got off the ground. So, talk a little bit about. And again, this isn't your first rodeo launching a product. Talk a little bit about that process of, as Peter Thiel would say, going from zero to one uh, and just getting started once you had proof of concept and, and, and you had the product. Sure. Yeah. Um, and so you alluded to, you know, kind of moonlighting a little bit. Um, that That's something that I have done as well. So I can, I can speak to that as well. Um, but going from zero to one. uh you know, it's it's all. I mean, this is this is more entrepreneurship than marketing, right? Sure, the, yeah. Answer this question, but um, the two are obviously interrelated, right? And but going from zero to one is all. There's there's two things. It's you know having the the the, the inner fortitude to to just do uh, anything, and then just every day making it part of your everyday practice of one step at a time. And if if you are consistent with that approach just every single day doing maybe every single work day uh you do need to take some time off right every single work day doing something to progress your vision and to achieve your vision and if you do that after three months and you look back in the rearview mirror nine times out of ten you're gonna look back and be like wow i actually got some stuff done i actually worked and, and you can say, say the same thing for you know, a, a, a traditional non-entrepreneurship role as well, right? Just if you, every day, if you're consistent with it and you, and you hone your skills. But the thing that the, what's different about doing it as an entrepreneur is and going from zero to one is if you don't do it, no one else does. When you're part of a larger organization, if you don't do something, chances are someone else is going to pick it up. <laughs> yep. or, or there's different divisions or no one's going to notice that you didn't do it. Or, you know, you might slip through the cracks or you had a bad week and, and, and whatever, and, or you go on vacation and no one even notices that you left, you know, like that's, that, uh, that's the upside of a, of a uh, organization is there is redundancy, hopefully some redundancy. Um, but then the up downside is there's redundancy. Like you, you're not the only person that can get things done when you've got your own company and you're not, you are the only person who can get things done. And so yeah. if you don't do it, no one else does. Therefore, after three months, you could be, you could look in the rearview mirror and be like, I didn't get anything done. But if, if you are consistently using every, every day uh, to, to do anything, do something with to progress towards your goal, 
then chances are you're going to look back after three three months. Every and that's what every three months I look back on on what I've done. I'm like, did I did I accomplish enough for me to move on to the next three months? Um, and yeah. so that, that's for me how to go for. And then you know, because zero to one is is hard. You know, and one to two is incrementally easier. Two to three is incrementally easier, and hopefully three to but but two to two hundred is is really hard. <laughs> Right, like getting it is, but I would argue that that zero to one is harder than two to two hundred because because of everything. Uh, yeah, I, I, think said, you, I think you're right. I think you're right. You zero get that one is harder. wheel of momentum. Yeah, and then going from two to two hundred is a little bit easier. But zero to one, you're right. Getting the momentum yeah. is the hardest thing to do, and and, and back, it's it's uh, the hardest thing to do is to get somebody to pull money out of their pocket, get a random stranger to pull money out of their pocket for your product. Yeah, that whether whether your product is is five dollars or five million dollars or, or 50 cents getting a consumer to pull money out of, out of their pocket for your product that is the hardest thing to do in business absolutely and i'll tell you i saw a tweet just about that today it's like if you can get someone to take one cent out of their wallet and give it to you for your product you're on your way like but right. you have to start somewhere right and and, start and, somewhere, that, yeah. and yeah and, and but, the, the, but that, that comes down to communicating what the product benefits are yeah Right. Uh, agreed. And, now, I, I want to back up for a little bit, Doug, because obviously, as we talked about, this isn't your first rodeo. Talk a little bit about some of your other launches and how those opened up the door for for where you're at now and getting Call Moment off to such a strong start so quickly. Sure. Yeah. No. I, I thank you for that opportunity to ch- of share some of that. So, my background is in wine marketing, which I don't. I might, I might be the only wine marketer you've had in the podcast. Um, but I spent about 15 years in wine marketing. Uh, that hence why I live in Napa Valley. I, I no longer am in wine marketing. I'm in CBD beverage marketing uh, and sales and leadership. Um, but uh, I, I moved up to Napa Valley initially to work at a winery called Chateau Montalena, a very famous winery that won the Judgment of Paris back in 1976. Um, worked for the Barrett family for many years. And that's actually where I hired uh, the Jamie Diaz. The, she was Jamie Rothberg at that point. But I hired, she was a random stranger, and I hired her to work in the tasting room um, while I was managing the hospitality department up here at the winery. And a year after I hired her, she introduced me to her sister. <laughs> and her sister became my wife. Um, and now Jamie is my sister-in-law, and she's now my business partner. Um, but Now that's but, return um, on relationships right there. Yeah, right. Great relationships. Exactly right. And strong, strong relationships and, and a strong, um, you know, partner. Yeah, well. and, and Jamie is a fantastic person um, and fantastic marketer. She's probably she's a better marketer than I, um, and so lucky to have her as my business partner. But um, so at, from Chateau Montalena, I I actually decided to go get my MBA and uh, to to shore up my um, uh, my education in, in business and had a great time getting my MBA. But while I was getting my MBA, I had a choice between pursuing a traditional MBA career. You know, as everyone's probably familiar with, this is the podcast or starting my own company as part of the one of the classes at the MBA program was an, a business plan competition class. And I had a, a classmate who had an idea for a new wine package. And I was the wine guy at the MBA program. And so I joined the, the class or joined the, the, the project. Um, and uh, we, we took uh, ultimately we took a drawing on a piece of paper from a gentleman named Matt Zimmer. Um, and Matt and Jody and I uh, decided to pursue that business plan competition project as a full-time job, as a full-time uh, startup. And so that eventually became this, which is we, we marketed as stacked wines. Um, so there are four individually packaged glasses of wine that Smart. come in a pre-sealed little container, which at the, at the time in 2011 – there were only two other products in the market that were similar. There was an aluminum can from Sofia Coppola. Um, and then there was a product called Copa Divino, which the, the gentleman who owns that was on Shark Tank twice. Um, and so uh, J- that was James Martin. And so, but we, we launched this, this product in 2011 uh, to rave reviews and, and rave PR. We were in Time Magazine. We were in the Atlantic Monthly Magazine. We were in Wine Spectator, Wine Enthusiast, and hundreds of other because it was a revolutionary way to bring, to make wine consumption more convenient um, and, and put it into a single serve package, right? And uh, so it was a great way to, to do that. So 
Now, um, question for your thirstier customers: Is there like a mega stack of like twelve cups? Oh, actually, well, I mean, <laughs> actually, I can't do it. I don't think with these. Uh, but yeah, if you took if you took all the packaging off and stacked them up, you could make like a magnum. Yeah. Oh, perfect! I like there that. Yep. It, it did come together. Yeah. The Vegas uh, edition. So I, I, for, I should, for all the podcasters, you can't the people listening on the podcasters that YouTube, you can't see what I'm doing. But yeah. It, it looks Podcast like listeners, yeah, if you're just listening on audio, go click the link in the show notes and go check out the video. You've got to see some <laughs> of the stuff that Doug is showing us today. This is great. And so um, there, there, there are many, like a mini Govino glass, essentially, that stack together like Legos. And the four of them stack together are the same liquid volume as a regular bottle of wine. But you can throw them in your purse. You can, you can throw them, you know, or, or in your bag, your, your, your beach bag or whatever, and take them wherever you want. Movie theaters and beach. And yeah, that I was, was going to say, perfect for smuggling into the movies. That's where my head went immediately. That's, yeah. yeah. Oh, oh we, we did a lot. We did a lot. And so um, I, I, I built that company with my two partners, Jody and Matt. And then I exited that company um, and uh, went back to a traditional, you know, wine marketing role. Um, you know, after the excitement of a startup. In that period, though, I was volunteering for a startup weekend um, and helping, you know, other entrepreneurs with their ideas and get them off the ground. And so as one of the, one of the projects, I met a gentleman by the name of John Bombeck. Um, and John had an idea for a product um, that he had made in his garage. He spent three years developing a prototype and he didn't know how to bring it to market. Um, or he, he was struggling to actually bring it to market and, and, and make, build the brand around it, build consumer base around it. And so he, uh, through the, my, my volunteer work at Startup Weekend, he approached me and said, hey, Doug, it, would you mind helping me with this new product that I have that I would like to bring to market? You have done such a great job with stacked wines. Uh, maybe you could help me do it with um, the product I have. So the product that he developed was uh, ultimately has now become the world's leading clear ice cube tray. Um, it's a tray that makes perfectly clear and perfectly square ice cubes. And so and I, for the, those of you on YouTube, here it is. Um, it's called True Cubes. Um, and so True Cubes um, solve the problem of um, making premium quality clear ice at home. Interesting. Um, and so prior to our, and we were not the first, uh, but we were the first to, to create some, some significant market commercial success. Awesome. And so we I, I feel like I'm on like an episode of like QVC or something. I'm waiting to take out my credit card and buy all this stuff <laughs> you're showing me. Goodness. <laughs> I, you didn't know, like you didn't know what you're getting yourself into, did you? Yeah. And so anyway, John and I spent about seven years building that brand. And that brand and that company was built entirely on the side. John and I kept our day jobs for the entire uh, length of our ownership of that company. Um, and so to answer, to, to, and I can I dig into that too, how to balance, you know, ha, ha, moonlighting and, and a day job. And so he and I built this brand mainly on Amazon. And, uh, and so we, we actually kind of built the entire category to the point where what we were, I think the third or the second or third uh, product that actually was commercially viable in the market. We weren't the first, but we were the first wave. And when when we sold the company a few months ago, there were probably 20 or 30 competitors. And so we actually, um, including one that was infringing on our IP, you know, that just flat out copied us that we, we had to, you know, address, which we did. Um, but uh, but we, we actually essentially built the, the category for at-home clear ice cube trays. And when bars and restaurants shut down during the pandemic, which in bars and restaurants were, were a big part of our consumer base, but 95% of our business was at-home users. But when they shut down, you couldn't get your premium cocktail. And so uh, at-home cocktail enthusiasts wanted to replicate the experience they had at their uh, favorite restaurant or bar, which largely, especially in larger markets, included a clear ice cube but making clear ice is almost impossible to do. Um, yeah. Even though Mother, Mother Nature um, naturally purifies and clarifies ice as it freezes, a man-made freezer doesn't do that. And so the whole invention of this machine, this analog device here is that it mimicked the way Mother Nature freezed ice. And we made it more consumer-friendly than anybody else out in the market. And we created 
better, you know, a, a better brand, better marketing to, to educate the consumer of why you would want to buy our premium ice cube tray. Um, and then ultimately we became the organic, uh, <laughs> we became the organic choice um, for, on Amazon. Uh, and then we actually did just have an exit a few months ago. Yep, absolutely. That's awesome. So well, congrats on to, that. Not, to, to bring this full circle. Sorry, I, I, I've been chatting. No, so this is great. Then, um, so of course, th- th- I had my stacked wines project. I had um, my True Cubes project, and then now I'm building Calm Moment. So you know, having experience in traditional brick and mortar retail, you know, developing stacked wines, um, and then and then ecom on Amazon with um, uh, True Cubes. You know, I've, I've got a little bit of both. And so, while, and then while I was building True Cube or managing True Cubes, I um, worked for a company called Jackson Family Wines, uh, which most people know their brand names, Kendall Jackson and La Crema and about 45 other wine brands out there. So I was sure. led um, e-com, led trade marketing, and eventually vice president of marketing um, for quite a few of their brands before I exited, before I left that company in December to pursue Calm Moment full time. So... I've got this, I've got an interesting kind of mix of like, you know, traditional, you know, large entity, you know, marketing with, you know, traditional brick and mortar um, and then startup world and, and e-com world. And like, you know, I kind of got this experience that, that, um, that, and so that long winded answer uh, to answer your question of, you know, what, what is driving, you know, some of the success with our, our marketing, pl- our sales and marketing platform for our new product. You know, it's a culmination of some pretty, you know, experience that, that, that directly builds into developing brand and developing distribution and developing strategy to get the consumer interested in the product. That's awesome, Doug. I, 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 I dig it. Now, I'm curious. There's one key difference right now with what you're doing with Call Moment versus your previous brands, and that is you are building during a recession. Uh, so uh, I'm curious, what challenges are you perceiving as uh, as we head into Q4 here at the time of this recording? And, you, you know, really calm moments just starting to get its feet under it. And and at the same time, we're in a recession. People aren't spending as much on perceived luxury items and uh, CBD beverages as well as top shelf alcohol will fall into that category for a large portion of the, the you know, mid-level consumers out there. So I'm curious. What, what are the biggest challenges that you're seeing and what's your plan to tackle? Yeah, I mean, well, recessions are challenging time, right? Whether Absolutely. it's a bear market or recession, it's, it's a challenging time for businesses to operate. But when you have no sales to compare <laughs> to, um, you know, it's, it, it, it's all relative, right? It's all relative. It, it, the recession is only relative to where you were a year ago. Right or two years ago, to, and to you're still month over right? month. Plan. Yeah, and for me, it's like I mean, okay, if, if I wasn't in a in a bear market or recessionary market right now, um, maybe maybe I would see an extra you know two two x sales, but I, I don't know. So I guess any going from go back to the zero to one discussion yeah. is like, all right, I was at, I was at zero six weeks ago, and now maybe I could be at two, you know, but I'm happy to be at one. And if, if I, you know, I'm, I naturally can only grow as, as, as much as my organic growth will, will, will support. And so I'm only going to fund what, what I, what I see. And so it's not like I'm cutting budget. I had no, I had no budget. Right. So it yeah. is a little bit different. So I, I guess I'm just thankful for any incremental sales that I'm getting and every incremental sale I have, right. Or any sale I get right now is incremental. Um, and so I'm, I'm not too concerned. I actually, but I'm actually, I'm thankful that I'm coming out in this type of market because, you know, you hear, you've heard it from many people. It, when I get through this, the next 24 months, when I get through it, then I, the, the worst, quote unquote, the worst will be over, right? And, yeah. and I have got nothing to compare it to, you know, per se with this exact product. And so I'm, I'm just, I'm cruising, you know, I'm just like, let's, Let's anything, anything above zero is good for me right now. And I'm thankfully I'm, I'm actually well above zero for the first few weeks. <laughs> good. That's, that's, that, that, that's awesome. I, I, I dig that. What, uh, what's, what's, I know you just signed with the distributor. What's next for you guys from a growth strategy standpoint, as you guys look to go from one to two to 200. Yeah. That's, um, so 
you know, we, we've taken a nice incremental step of getting, you know, a fantastic distributor here in Northern Beverage distributor here in Northern California, um, who's going to help us, you know, go from two to 10, hopefully, maybe even two to a hundred, who, who knows. But the, the objective for me is, you know, I, we got into this category, A, because my partner and sister-in-law, Jamie, loves the product and loves the category and wanted to build a better product. And so we're believers in this overall category. And, you know, we're, but as, as you've had a couple other um, CBD, THC products on the podcast, so your leader, listeners might know that it's not fully federally legal, right? And so there are challenges to bringing the product to market. And, but that's why there are some new competitors coming in and, and new, new products every, every day coming in. But my goal over the next 12 months is to, establish my brand in as in as many markets as I can. Hopefully I can get down to LA. Hopefully I can get up to Portland and Seattle, get out to Denver in the next 12 months. Establish my brand as a uh, as a key brand in, in the top category so that when the national accounts come in, Kroger, Albertsons, HEB, Publix, potentially Costco, Whole Foods, when they're ready to bring the category in, because they're not they're not doing it right now because it's not completely sure. federally legal. When they're ready to do it, I want to be on that table for consideration. That's my goal: is to establish my brand and my product so that when a major national account is ready to bring it in, I'm in the discussion. Sure, and I, I'd imagine just uh, the, you know the, the marketing strategist in me goes off around is almost like a race to build the biggest tangible audience around it, right? Even if the sales data isn't there to support it because let's be honest, shipping is a, is a nightmare in the beverage category and, and you're just getting started in NorCal. So maybe the sales numbers aren't huge, but if the audience is there to support it and the, and the concept is there and you've got a launch off point to me, that's got to give you a leg up with buyers in the conversation versus everyone else trying to spin something up at the last minute after it becomes federally legal. Yeah. And, and we, we haven't, we were not, we weren't the first, we weren't the first wave of products to come in, but we are the second wave of products. And now they're now, and, and we're ahead of the third and the fourth wave. And the, the, the first wave of products, some of them were, I think, challenged because they just put anything together they could and put it out there. Um, some of them with some very good marketing, but in our opinion, the product did not maybe meet the hype. Um, and so, but the second wave, there are some, some very good products. We believe we are the best product of the very good products. And so, you know, the, the, there, there's a double-edged sword to that, is that the consumer the past few months, the past couple of years, has tried, has tried, has di- dabbled in the category. And a lot of them, I've, I've been hearing the past, you know, two months, a lot of them have, been, have not come back because they weren't satisfied with the quality of the, the, the product. Um, sure. And so that, that's where, and buyers are echoing that kind of sentiment. And that's where I'm coming in and having to kind of rebuild the category a little bit of, hey, I know, I know you've had a, a trouble before. Try mine. Mine actually tastes good, and when they try it, they're they're sold. Yeah, absolutely, and and that that's awesome. Talk a little bit about your marketing strategy outside, because obviously, sampling is not nearly as easy or uh, feasible as it was, say, in 2018. Uh, so, with sampling not being the go-to marketing strategy that it used to be in CPG land, uh, what is your go-to-market strategy from a marketing standpoint? Yeah, so. Um, we've built a lot of that into the packaging. Of course, you know, pa- packaging is a, is a very important component Absolutely. in CPG, right? And so what we've done with the packaging is we've tried to, to build in, we, we've tried to create the branding and the messaging to be more mass appeal, um, not to be, uh, not to fit into, because CBD, where it's legal is, is legal at, at grocery. You know, it's, it's, you know, you, you, these products can be sold as long as it's less than the 0.3% threshold of THC. It can be sold anywhere, at least in the state of California and most other states where, you know, where things are relatively open. So it doesn't sure. need to go into a dispensary, right? And so dispelling that kind of myth of, of you know, when, when you want your THC products, when you want your harder products, go to the dispensary. But when you want something a little bit softer, come to the CBD category. And, and our, so our approach to, to packaging and branding is making this more mass appeal, both in flavor and in branding. 
Uh, and so we we are, um, you know, calm, calm moment. The world needs more calm. Getting something that we believe consumers can relate to. Um, you know, bringing colors that are, we, we went with what we call a jewel tone, you know, kind of color uh, lineup of jewel tones. So making them, you know, hopefully uh, uh, appeal to the, the, um, the eye. We're using, we are, we're using a gold cap. You know, I should have brought, but I've got a gold cap that I wear when I go out in sales calls. I've got to bring it. Um, but but bringing ma- making the product more accessible and more and easier to understand and easier to consume, uh, to kind of get CBD out as and differentiate it from THC, which a lot of consumers surprisingly are aware of that difference. Believe it or not, they are aware, especially you know the under fifty you know kind of crowd. That's a large swath under fifty. It's a lot of people. Sure, they are mo- for the most part. They are they are aware that THC is a, it has a different use and, and purpose than CBD. They are aware that CBD is generally more easily accessible through um, retail or e-com. And so our job as marketers is to, uh, is to help uh, educate about where to buy it, why to use it, um, and make, make the, pa- you know, specifically the packaging, you know, an approachable uh, um, and, and approachable and, and, understandable, relatable, um, you know, message. And one of the things that we're, that we're, we, we don't have this on the packaging, but this is something that is, is we're, we're, how do you, how do you bring a very complex discussion and, and, and simplify it for the consumer and at the risk of oversimplifying, which can happen, but you do need to break it down. And so one of the things that we're beginning to talk about the CBD category, at least I'm beginning to talk about the CBD category as a category development, forget about product development, just category sure. development, it's kind of the anti-caffeine or the anti-energy mm-hmm. drink. Yeah. Um, and so, but, but then looking to the growth of the energy drink category for cues on how they did it. Red Bull, Rockstar, Highball, you know, and, and a, a dozen others, you know, Red Bull and Rockstar, or Red Bull being the, the leader, you know, in the category, you know, 20 years ago now, or 15, or maybe more than that. Um, how did they build their category and get the consumer to to switch to their to their product versus other existing products? And so, using lessons from that, the, the, the category growth of that, and then now, and kombucha is a, a more recent example, the kombucha category. Um, taking some lessons out of how they built the product and made it mass appeal, made it um, a, a viable category that was th- that that had scale to it yeah um, and so that's that's our challenge and and so we're trying to do that on a micro scale with our brand but also hopefully help the category overall and that's you know something i learned building true cubes my ice cube tray as all right when we came out nobody my, my mother when i came out with true cube she's like why would anybody ever pay 45 dollars for an ice cube tray and i was like well because you don't know that you don't know who i'm targeting and yeah. um and then when I sold the company a few months ago, she's like, Doug, I was wrong. <laughs> That's and great. So, but it, it, it comes down to, to category growth and category management, understanding the category and understanding how your product can be a leader within that category. Absolutely. And it, 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 oftentimes it is about how, how effectively, not often, how effectively can you, communi- can you communicate to the consumer yeah. what the value proposition is of the category first, you know, primarily, and then your product within the category. Uh, Yeah, and I agree. And I think what you're doing is really smart. It's funny. I just had this conversation with a new client of ours in the golf space yesterday. And right now, golf as a sport is booming, right? So everyone's getting outside, playing more. It's social. And uh, you have a lot of new golfers in the space, but they're not comfortable for shopping the way, you, you know, your grandpa that's golfed for 60 years shops for clubs or apparel or any of it, right? And And so there's the significant opportunity to meet customers where they are, uh, especially when they're new to the category. And I think the CBD space, both beverage and otherwise is in the same category. There's so many people that are going to take advantage of beverages like calm moment that would never walk into a weed shop, right? Like they just, they just would like never, like they'll they'll never go there, but they'll, they'll drop 20 bucks a week on it at, at, at Costco or Publix or wherever. Right. And so I think there's such an opportunity there to meet the consumer where they are. And I, and I hope our marketing leaders listening in are taking note of this. Like if you can meet your 
customers where they are, especially the ones that are new to the space, goodness, you can win. And you can win in a cost-effective way versus having to uh, blast everything and overpay for top-level influencers to build that credibility. So I, I think I think you're going about it the right way for sure. I think there's a lot of opportunity there for you guys. Absolutely. Meet, meet the customer where they are. And there are there as as big as THC is becoming, which is great. Uh, all, all, you know, rising tide races all boats, right? I'm all for it. Um, but as big as that that market is, there are uh, 10,000 more points of distribution for CBD. Yeah. Um, and so ju- just that alone is and, and there might even be 10,000 more consumers that are that, that are currently comfortable with CBD who are not comfortable with THC. Yep. Yeah. No, one thousand. But the, the but the THC market has much bigger margins and and higher price points, and so it's a good business in and of itself. Uh, you know, uh, but that's not that's not the the sector or category that that uh, we're focused on. Yeah, that, that's that, that's that's awesome, Doug. And I want to be respectful of your time here. For uh, those of you that don't know when we're recording this, it is the Friday going into Labor Day weekend, and Doug is the sacrificial lamb that was willing to come on and give up part of that Friday to hang out with me. Uh, Doug, last question for you. If you had one key takeaway for our marketing leaders listening in today, what would that be? Yeah. Uh, so after listening to, uh, after you, you got me hooked on your podcast, um, a few weeks ago, I've been listening to a lot of, and I knew Thank this you. question was coming. Um, and I, by the way, I, I love the podcast. And when I was listening to, to your other guests, I'm like, oh my God, like he wants me to come speak. All right, great. Okay. But anyway, um, so thank you for having me first and foremost. Thank you for coming. Uh, I, I hope the I hope the listeners um, uh, get, got something valuable out of the, the past, you know, forty minutes. Absolutely. And, and so I knew this question was coming, but um, <laughs> so I, I had an answer for you. But I, I, you already, you kind of, I already, I already kind of gave my insight, which was do something every day, you know, and, and make make it a ritual. You know, not not to tie it into my brand. I didn't intend to tie it into my brand, but you know, make make your calm moment a ritual, but also make your <laughs> Your, your business development, a ritual every day. And if, if you, when you bring it into your life as a ritual and work on, especially if you have a side project, especially if you're passionate about something, especially if you've got an idea, everyone has an idea, but not everyone knows how to execute it and bring it to market. Yep. And um, just work on it every day for hopefully an hour every day or every work day. And after three months, you'll look back and be amazed at what you've accomplished. And don't be shy. Don't be afraid. Don't be, you know, uh, if, if you don't start, you've already failed, right? And so if you're afraid of failure, if that's the reason why you're not, you're not, you haven't started, you've already, you've, you've already uh, fulfilled your fear. You've already, your fear has already come true. Um, and so the only way to and, and call, call, just call anybody. Like I, I've been in, in, in my, you know, 15 years of, of, start, of starting businesses and whatnot, and, and learning new things, I, I've, it's 99 times out of 100, unless you're calling Mark Cuban, unless you're calling, you know, Elon Musk or trying to get his attention or whatever. If you if you just call, you know, quote unquote, you know, good, good business people or good vendors, 99 times out of 100, they're going to return the phone call. They may not have the answer you are looking for. They mm-hmm. may not be able to help you directly. But if you ask, who can I talk to? Do you have any recommendations who I can talk to? They 99 times out of 100 will say, oh, yeah, go call this person, call this person. Oh, they, they spe- they're more focused on smaller companies. Go call them. We're not, you're not big enough for us yet. And, but the key there is just calling, doing something. Do, go, it's so easy now with Google and, and it's, you know, to go learn the world. And, um, and, then, and then I guess the other piece of advice that I'll give, this is more for an entrepreneur or versus a marketer, but my advice that I give to entrepreneurs is, you know, you, you have to be uh, a jack of all trades and master of many. Um, and the only way to get there is to do, 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 do. You got to roll up your sleeves. You got to dig in. You got to, and if no one else does it, if you, if you, sorry, if you don't do it, no one else is going to do it. I already mentioned that already on the podcast, but there, there's a, a little bit of hopefully an inspiration to go out and, and seize the day and do what you got to do. And, be be your own boss and be in charge of your destiny because it it uh, you'll be surprised what you what you can accomplish when you put your mind to it and it just you got it in one foot after another small incremental steps and eventually you will accomplish big goals. That's awesome, Doug. Thank you so much for coming on the Lion Share Marketing Podcast and uh, 
real quick, uh, shout out your website so our listeners can go check out the product and order some for themselves. Yeah, sure. So our, our uh, e-com site, we just launched the site about a month ago. It's brand new. It's, it's pretty basic, but it's drinkcalmmoment.com. Uh, TikTok, Instagram, at drinkcalmmoment. Um, and so we, we literally are launching our, um, our uh, uh, social media presence like next week. So we're, we're still pretty young. But we would love to get any followers and, and follow along the journey. Awesome. That's great. Well, we'll certainly be following along and cheering you on. And uh, I can't wait to try it myself. So uh, yeah, Doug, thanks again for coming on. All right. Thanks so much. Thank you. All right, everybody, that wraps up episode 124 of the Lion Share Marketing Podcast. Thanks again for listening along. Thanks again to Doug for coming on and dropping knowledge bombs. We've got another great episode coming up. Uh, stay tuned. Our next episode in 125, we have Kurt Staubach coming on to do a retention marketing deep dive. So uh, all of your retention marketing questions will be answered in one spot. And if they're not, we'll give you your money back, guaranteed. So thanks again for listening. And until next time. You've been listening to the Lion Share Marketing Podcast, brought to you by Fidelitas.co. Get measurable results from a strategic partner because winners keep score.